Now we've reached the point in our study in Revelation that six of the seven seals have been opened. Uh, Those six seals have opened the door for God's judgment to be poured out on earth. Uh, Judgment on mankind that has rejected Jesus. Now as the seventh seal is opened, that action will bring seven trumpets. In chapter 8, as we will look at today, four of those trumpets will uh, be blown. And they're going to show us something. They're going to show us God's mercy. See, God's heart is seen again in a warning to a rebellious world that they need to turn to Jesus. And they need to turn to Jesus before it's too late. And you will see these trumpets of judgment actually spare more than they destroy. And this should bring to mind two things for the life of a believer today. Uh, The believer should be reminded of the love of God that sent Jesus to the cross for our sins that would be paid for, that we wouldn't be judged for. And you and I will be raptured out of this world and not endure this horrible judgment that is coming upon this earth. The second thing it should do is we should be encouraged to share our faith to our unsaved friends and family. Because as we will continue, we will see things get really bad. And I don't want to be there, and I don't think you do either. And we definitely don't want our friends and family and loved ones to be there. See, if you are not a believer in Jesus, I pray that after you hear these coming judgments today from God, that you will reconsider giving your life to Jesus. See, today is the day of salvation. And salvation can be for you right now. So the question is how? Well, you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, to come into your life, and to be your Lord and Savior. And if you pray this prayer, you will also find new life today. You will become a new creation in Christ. You will be saved from this judgment. And if you do this, I would ask that you'd come and see me after service or one of the people wearing one of those lanyards. Here's what we won't do. We don't take your name, put you on a mailing list and start bombarding you with text and emails. What we want to do is just give you a Bible and a Bible study guide and help you on your walk with Jesus. And if this is the church home that you end up being at, then awesome. And if not, then you need to go where God's calling you to be. But we want to help you start out in your walk with Jesus. And the best way to do that is to give you a Bible and you get reading his word to get to know him. If you look around at the people that are smiling, you'll see that uh, giving your life to Jesus is the best decision anybody could ever make in their life. So chapter 7, we have seen six seals that have been opened. And as we studied last week, after the sixth seal, God paused his judgment. He then opened, uh, he then put his mark on 144,000 Jewish men. His seal was on them, meaning that they would not be affected by the judgment of God, nor the horrors of the new world regime, the Antichrist. See, they have one job, to proclaim Jesus. Even in God's judgment, God is still giving people the opportunity to come to him. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. See, in chapter 7, we read that worship was going on in the throne room. Heaven is praising the Lord. These people that had lost their lives, that had been martyred for Christ during the tribulation, are worshiping the 24 elders, the four Weird looking creatures. Everyone is worshiping the Lord. And then Jesus opens this seventh seal, which will allow the scroll to be opened. 
And what does John witness? Silence. Think about it. That throne room that is full of an an uncountable amount of people worshiping the Lord, giving glory to God for all that he has done, becomes silent. Why don't we try that? Let's try right now to sit for 30 minutes and not say a word. I'm not going to make you sit here for 30 minutes. But have you ever tried that? Have you ever just stopped? Turn your phone off, turn the TV off, turn your computer off, and go sit somewhere in silence. I I think that we've got a problem in our day and age today. We are constantly bombarded with information, aren't we? I mean, sometimes we don't even have time to stop and actually think. And in fact... I would say that there's, uh, there's a spiritual part of that that I think the enemy wants to get us to not to think. Something happens and we just do it. Because, well, that's what we do. Do we wait for our favorite YouTube channel to tell us how to act? Do we wait for the government to tell us what we can and can't do? Sometimes it just seems like we're little puppets, doesn't it? But what does God's word say? You know, the the amazing thing about God's word is that even though there's not necessarily a chapter and verse for everything that you go through in life, there are principles. And we're going to see some of those principles as we go through this, specifically about God's judgment. So let's continue. Verse 2. And I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, who are these seven angels? Well, the text doesn't tell us. We possibly might know who two of them might be. Possibly Gabriel or Michael. Now, in Luke... Uh, when Zacharias was in the temple and an angel came and spoke to him, we have this verse, Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 19, says, the angel of the Lord answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and to bring you these glad tidings. Well, these seven angels are in the presence of God. This might be one of them. Uh, In Revelation 12, Michael And his angels will be in a fight against the dragon. In the book of Jude, Michael is called an archangel. Now understand that word is not in the Old Testament, archangel. In Daniel 10, Michael is named as one of the chief angels. Uh, Something interesting in the Apocrypha, which we don't consider inspired scripture, they name the other five and one of them is named Raphael. Now again, this is speculation. We do not know because the Bible doesn't tell us. So we have on the scene seven angels that are given each a trumpet. Verse 3. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Now another angel walks up and he's got something in his hand, a golden censer. I got a picture of that, golden censer. Whatever you thought it might be, it's a weird little thing. It's got chains on it. You can put coal in it. You put incense in it. It smokes. Any of you ever been in some uh, more uh, liturgical churches? They sometimes do that. But it's a small jar, two sections. The bottom holds hot coals. The top part is for incense. You close it up and the heat of the coals burns the incense and it smells. And this angel has a censer with incense and is given 
the prayers of the saints. So, who is this angel? Anybody want to know? Well, some believe that this guy is Jesus. Why? Well, because Jesus is the mediator between God and man, right? Paul wrote to, first in, to Timothy, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, where there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So he's got prayers, might be him. And this angel is taking the prayers to the Father. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 tells us that through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father, Jesus. This could be Jesus. See, that all makes sense, right? So prayers, the prayers and incense, what exactly is that all about? Look at verse four, it says, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Now this angel has taken the censer and a handful of incense and the prayers of the martyrs, mixed it together, and now the throne room is full of an amazing, wonderful aroma. Think about this for a moment. Prayers, the incense. He's been given these prayers. Do you think God values prayer? Yeah, I would say he does. And these prayers specifically, God has stored up, waiting for the right moment to answer them. And these prayers are mixed with incense. I'm going to show my age a little bit for you younger people. Sorry, but you guys remember the 70s, late 60s, incense? You buy those little things? Yeah, you're shaking your head no like you're, I know you know. And we would buy those things and you light them and they just burn. They put all this smell. I mean, they smelled weird. But you, I mean, that was a big thing back then. Uh, but praise the Lord, we have plug-ins and Yankee candles now, right? We don't, we don't have those things. I remember going to a wedding one time and the church was a very traditional wedding and there was a communion service going on before the wedding started. And so the wedding party is kind of sitting outside waiting. And um, I stuck my head in and there wasn't a lot of people there, but a guy had a sensor. And, he's, and I mean, that place was full of smoke. I mean, it was like walking into a like the barn when we decided to have uh, fire pits. Remember that Sunday? And <laughs> Joe started to sing and he breathes in a bunch of smoke. I mean, that was what it was. So, but I don't think this was an uncomfortable situation in the throne room of God. See, those prayers to God bring him pleasure. This incense mixed with prayer is filling the room. And these prayers are prayers that he has saved for this particular moment. But you know what, I believe that it's true for all prayers. David wrote in Psalms that prayers rise like incense before God. You've probably heard that song, but look at this verse. Psalm chapter 141, verse 1 and 2. Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting of my hands as an evening sacrifice. So you understand what prayer is, right? What does it mean? Are you ready? Communication with God. When you talk to God, you are praying. David says that prayer is like incense filling the room and he lifts his hands in worship for a sacrifice. You know, Joe, Joe talked a little bit at the beginning about sacrifice of worship. And sometimes we don't feel like it. I mean, let's be honest. Is there times, don't raise your hand, but are there times that you come here and you don't feel like worshiping? I mean, you're struggling with something and you just, you're not into it. In fact, you, did, you barely got here. Let me encourage you, when you are struggling with worship, here's what you need to do. You need to sacrifice yourself. Whether you feel like it or not, worship. Begin to think about all that God has done in your life and how much he loves you. See, God is worthy of your praise. And it doesn't matter what song. 
It doesn't matter who's singing. It doesn't necessarily matter where you're at. You can worship anywhere. Verse 5. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and he threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Why is this action so dramatic? See, this angel adds fire from the altar, and he throws it down to the earth. Now remember from chapter 6, the Christians, these are Christians that have been killed in the tribulation. And they were under the altar, crying out for justice. They asked God, when are you going to judge the evil and avenge our death? And God gave them a white robe and he said, you need to wait. Well, see, now the waiting is over. The time has come. Verse 6. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. As these martyrs have cried out for justice... Their cry is a cry that I would say each of us have made at one time in our lives. You and I look around and we see the atrocities of the world, the things that are going on, and we ask, right? Have you ever, why God? Why is this going on? Why don't you stop this? Why is this happening? Is it me? Or just me? Anybody else? You ever ask those questions? Uh, I would encourage you to go back and listen to our study through Habakkuk because that's the question Habakkuk asks asks God. And we had three uh, wonderful studies of those three chapters. Go back and listen to that. But here in Revelation, God is judging the world for their sin. Now think about this. We have been waiting for the seventh seal to be opened. And yet, God has not Wiped out the world. Final judgment hasn't happened. See, the seventh seal will start the sequence of seven trumpets. Now understand, God loves you. He sent his son to die for you to pay the penalty of your sin and to have eternal life. And when you accept God's payment for your sin, you can live in victory and be used by God in awesome ways. But why has this judgment being prolonged? If God's who he says he is, couldn't he just go, and it's done? But he doesn't. The bad people are judged, and the good people are saved. Why won't God just snap his fingers and make that happen? See, I think this is... This is one of the hardest things for you and I to understand about God. Believers and unbelievers struggle and ask this question. How can a loving God allow evil in this world? And I think there's two specific questions that really come out of that. Why do bad things happen to good people? Anybody ever asked you that question? How about this one? If God is love, then why? And fill in the blank. Something happens to someone that we don't think deserve that bad thing to happen to them? A death or something? We all have tons of questions that we see. God, if you exist, why does this happen? But we need to understand that these are old questions. These are not questions that are just in our day and age. Remember our, uh, when we read through the Bible, we read through the book of Job. Job was a good man, well respected in the community. He was rich, had a lot of stuff, and he loved God. But something happened. One day he lost everything. Then later, he lost his health. He was suffering physically. He lost his house, his business, his kids, his health. Things are so bad, his wife comes to him and says, listen, why don't you just curse God and die? Now, 
four of his friends come to see him. And when they see what he looks like, what he's going through, what he's lost, they have nothing to say. They sat with him for seven days. Nothing to say. Then after seven days, Job speaks. And he says, you know what? This stinks. In fact, he's so distraught with his life, he makes the comment, you know, it would be better if I was born dead than to live like this. And then as human nature goes, his buddies begin to respond to his words. Now, they could have responded, obviously, like you and I probably would have. Oh, Job, hey man, we're here for you, buddy. And we'll pray for you. What can we do for you? See, that's not how they responded. See, they come to the conclusion that Job must have done something wrong. And then they begin to give him counsel and correct his obviously bad, sinful behavior. Why? See, Job's friends cannot understand why a loving God would allow a person to go through what Job was going through. Job obviously must really be a bad person. I mean, he obviously is secretly sinning in some way, somehow. God is judging Job. Now, his buddies actually give good counsel, but the problem is is that that counsel does not apply to Job's situation whatsoever. Again, they could not understand how a God of love could allow evil to happen to Job. Why? Why? Now again, so if we fast forward about 1,700 years. Around 300 BC, there was a Greek philosopher named Epicurus. In his teachings, he concluded that there cannot be a loving God and evil in the world. The two cannot coexist, and here's his reasons. God obviously isn't able to deal with evil. He doesn't have enough power, or he doesn't care. Thought number one. Thought number two, if God is God, he should be able and willing to deal with evil in this world. So his conclusion, since evil exists, there is no God. Now this was 2,300 years ago. See, the question of if God is love, why is there evil in this world? That question's been around for a long time. Another question, if God is love, how can he send anyone to hell? You ever heard that one? Right? Any of you guys that share Jesus, like you go out with Matt and you hit the streets, that's, that's one thing you hear often. Well, if God is love, then why would he send people to hell? We must understand that hell is judgment for sin. For a life that has been lived in rebellion to God. A life that has refused pardon by God. So the Bible answers both of these questions. If God is love, why does evil exist? And if God is love, why does he send people to hell? Here's the answer. Forgive me, my sinuses are going nuts today. I left you in a cliffhanger. Here's the answer, and then I didn't answer. See, God didn't design this world, this world that you and I live in today. God made a garden paradise with all kinds of living creatures, and he made man, and he made man and woman with free will. Listen carefully. There is no relationship without free will. If my wife is with me because I demand her submission and care, that is not relationship. If I choose to be with my wife and she chooses to be with me, 
See, Missy's dad didn't grab his gun and show up at my house and say, pointed at me and say, listen, you are going to marry my daughter. See, that's not relationship. Relationship is a choice. In that paradise of Eden, enter, evil entered the world. Evil, be, evil began in the world when man decided to disobey God. When Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, disobey his word, his word, sin entered the world. See, they had a choice and they chose poorly. Today, are you ready? Sin and evil are continually perpetuated in the world that we live in when you and I choose to disobey God. God wants this. And you want this. And you choose this. God, I want it my way. Whatever horrific thing that is going on in this world, if you know your Bible, you will see clearly that those things absolutely violate anything of God and of his word. See, sin and evil have perpetuated our world. Thus, the cry of believers and non-believers, the why God? Revelation, all those prayers have been stored up. Those cries of the saints, why? And the day is coming when God will answer those prayers of why. In fact, this day is so serious in heaven that there's 30 minutes of silence. Verse 7. And the first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown down to earth as the third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. Now, hail and fire falling like, uh, I mean, the example I think of is Sodom and Gomorrah of what we read in Genesis. There's no safe place to hide. Can you imagine what this kind of destruction would do to the ecosystem? But now again, God doesn't destroy everything, only a third. Verse 8 and 9, And when the second angel sounded, something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. That says something like a great mountain. Whatever it is, it's big. And whatever it does, it's very catastrophic to ocean life. Now in Florida, we have every once in a while, it's called red tide. And what red tide is, it's this algae... um, bloom that happens. It turns the water red. The the air is literally toxic. Uh, I mean, you can breathe it, but it's not good for you. Your eyes burn, uh, like uh, the barrier islands that really get affected with it, they evacuate most of them. And with that, the sea life, anything around like for about a half mile out, dies, and it all gets washed up to shore. So you got this stench that smells like you're smelling gasoline. It burns your eyes. And then you've got this stench of dead fish all over the ocean. It happened, it lasted for about two weeks. Finally, it removed itself. And that's just a little thing that happens once in a while in our world. It says a third of the ships go down. So I was curious. How many ships are on our oceans today? Ready? This uh, Thomas Net says that there's roughly 55,000 ships that carry cargo, oil tankers, chemical tankers, cruise ships. That means 18,300 will be destroyed. Now let's just talk cargo for, for, for a moment. What would that do to the economy? You know, 
we live on an island here, mostly self-sustaining, but there are some things that are imported. What would that do? Verse 10, Then a third, of the angel, third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many died from the water because it was made bitter. You ever had drank bitter water before? Right. Not the water that would kill you, but just water that just really oh, taste awful. I mean, it just kind of sits there. I'm not being real gross, but I mean, it just makes everything want to come up. <laughs> and it reminded me, uh, Missy and I went on our, a late honeymoon. We'd been married about a year and a half, and we decided to go to Cancun, Mexico. So anybody ever been to Mexico? Yeah, so one of the things they tell you is don't drink the water, right? If you're going to drink, you drink bottled water or uh, canned soda or something because the people there are used to it, but there's just things in the water. They don't filter it that well, and you get sick. In the United States, they call it Montezuma's Revenge from the uh, Mexican-American War. And uh, Missy somehow got some water, and she was sick. Not to mention that we had just found out two days before we left that she was pregnant. So she had morning sickness and then stomach virus for about two weeks when we got back. Now again, I'm giving you minor stories, I'm giving you minor analogies, but this is something that is affecting a third of the world. Fresh water supply, gone. These four trumpets have affected the things that mankind has no control over. Yet in this, we still see God's mercy because in a sense, they're partial judgments. Only a third of the world is being affected with whatever these categories are. And again, all of these, the goal is that God is calling man to repent. Repent before the final scene, the final judgment. See, God intentionally is sparing more than he consumes in his judgment. Verse 13, And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet and the three angels who are about to sound. Now, how many of your Bibles say eagle in there instead of angel? Anyone? NIV, ESV, uh, New Living says eagle. So why the discrepancy? I always like to figure out these questions. So the discrepancy is because of this. There's about half of the older text. Uh, it says eagle. And about half of the newer older text say angel. Some commentators or, or scholars say that, well, it's a spelling error because they're spelled kind of alike in the Greek. So I thought, okay, well, I'll look that up. Well, anglios, angel, right, which it's the Greek word that means messenger, is A-G-G-E-L-O-S. But eagle is A-E-T-O-S. I don't see how you could get those two confused, right? Uh, for, for you all that like to just, why, why, why? Like I, I, I find sometimes I get so much uh, focused on that little discrepancy, I forget why the whole thing's there. So I think one of the things we need to remember is that if God is God, he can use an animal to give a message, or an angel, or an eagle, or a donkey, right? So then the, the bigger question is, what is the message? See, the message is woe times three. Pastor Chuck, in his teaching in this passage, he said, uh, this is a fair warning of what's ahead. And he put it this way, if you think you have seen something bad, you haven't seen anything yet. Because these next three trumpets a third of the population will die. 
And that's the end of the chapter. And you're thinking, well, Kenny, why did you end it that way? Well, I think there's a couple of things that we need to understand. In God's judgment, he still loves his people and he's drawing people to him. And we should not live a flippant life of, well, we've said the prayer and everything's okay and I'm going to heaven and I'll just live my life. I think there's an urgency here again for us. See, we, we not only need to live a life of sharing Jesus, but we need to live a life that shares Jesus. You ever heard that quote? I think it's from Augustine, St. Augustine. He said, you know, you should share Jesus everywhere you go, and if necessary, use words. Right? Now understand something. Uh, you need to share words. Or let your phone ring. If you don't share words, you're not going to make much of an impact. You can make more of an impact if you share words and have a lifestyle that, that is showing the love and grace of Jesus. So, you know, for us today, I think we should walk out of here with this. Lord, who is in my life that you would want me to make an impression on for you? A lot of pressure, right? Okay, then the next thing is this. Are you willing to allow God to use you? Because we know you're not perfect. All I got to do is talk to your family and friends. <laughs> you talk to mine. Oh, no, I, you hang around me long enough, you're going to find something about me you don't like. So, Lord, how do I, how do, I do this? Well, we walk, we walk in the Spirit, right? As Paul said, walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We need to see, be seeking the Lord in all that we have and all that we do and allow Him to use us. Because this day is coming. You know, if we were to discuss, we're going to get into it in a few more chapters, if we were to discuss 30 years ago, one world government or one world economy system, a one world currency, we all would not even have a clue how about how that could ever happen. Right? And do you realize how close we are? Do you realize that things are moving? They're going, they're planning a one world government. A one world currency. If the Bible is right about some of those things, uh, where has it been wrong yet? See, the reality is, is all these things that we're coming to fruition in our world today, the Bible has told us about. That's to bring urgency. Not scared urgency, but hey, you need to know Jesus, right? Because that's the only guy that's going to save you out of this craziness. Amen? Thank you.